Nancy Brown. Oh, is it not? Come on up. I think I did it in the correct even order. How about that? If not, we'll recognize you. Nice to see all of you. Thanks for being here. No, I have to start with you. You don't have to. I'm going to, okay? You're sitting right here. This is your first feature after so much great TV work. Why was this the perfect film debut for you? Well, that's yet to be seen, I suppose. Uh, story. Oh, well, you know, I, I get to make all the stories that I want for the small screen. And so in thinking about making a movie for a movie theater, which is still where some people see movies, <laughs> You know, I wanted to think about what would be a theatrical experience that you could only have in the movies. And, and there's something about this story that, that starts in space, it's got the scope to it, it has an underwater training sequence, it feels like a big film, but it's really a drama um, about a woman having an existential crisis. And what started to excite me about it was this idea of making a subjective film in which you, you are in her head and seeing the world through her eyes. And so when she's in space, everything looks enormous. And when she comes to Earth, everything gets smaller. And we can have that experience in the theater. The sound it can work to our advantage. So, you know, I always like to think about what are we taking for granted as storytellers. And one of the things we take for granted is the screen itself. Elliot, you and Brian have known each other since you guys were like pre-teenagers. It's true. What interested you in this story when you first heard about it? So uh, we grew up in the Orlando area. We knew people that worked at NASA. We, you know, grew up in a, we would go to shuttle launches uh, at the tail end of the shuttle program. And the thing that always fascinated us was that these are these people that were like real world superheroes to us, action figures. Um, but they were also just like the people that like came to the target that I worked at at the same time. Um, and so we were really fascinated by just sort of like big giant experiences happening to normal everyday people and what that would do to their normal everyday lives. And then Elliot, from your point of view, like even though you grew up with all of this, what kind of added research did you guys have to do at the Del Taco when you were writing the script to make sure that you were getting it accurate? Yeah. That's right. Brian and I wrote this in the Del Taco in Silver Lake. Uh, we had a lot of time on our hands. I've been there. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you know, it, it, it's its own unique place, but you know, I think when we first started writing together out here in Los Angeles, we thought, you know, maybe a coffee shop was a little too nice for us, and we like to know our place. Um, but as far as the research that we did, Again, like Brian said, we, we grew up in this. You know, seeing a shuttle launch, a rocket launch of any sort is one of the great cheap thrills that you can have in the Central Florida area. Um, and I think we were always in awe of it. We have tremendous respect for the people who did this. You know, it's inspired um, very loosely on real events. And in researching um, <clears throat> that specific crime, I think the things that uh, really spoke to us were little details that helped us sort of unlock the humanity behind this. You know, this story, um, as initially reported, was very sensational. Um, astronaut love triangle, woman in a diaper. It, it's, it, it felt too broad. Um, but for us, I think the thing that really unlocked it was the list of items um, that were found uh, at the arrest, uh, links of tubing, specific amounts of rope, specific amounts of um, uh, of, uh, what else? And all sorts of things, the BB gun, the, uh, the pepper spray, and maybe the diaper, right? And when you take the assumption that NASA um, has the best of the best there, and you see the specificity of these items, you realize that this isn't somebody who's falling apart. This is somebody who's falling apart in an extremely structured way. <laughs> and for, for Brian and I, the question became, how does something like this happen? How could something like this possibly happen? Great. Natalie, um, for you, I, it's funny that Elliot uses the word unlock because that's what I was thinking about when I was watching this film and thinking about what I wanted to ask you is what unlocked your understanding of Lucy, a woman who's had experiences that are so different from anything that any of us have ever gone through or will ever go through, and, and a, a mental uh, kind of journey that is very different from something that we go through. What was your, what was the key to understanding her for you? Well, I think it was really um, about this existential crisis that Noah and I talked about a lot of 
what happens when you have this experience that makes you feel more alive than ever and have more meaning than ever. But part of that experience is really realizing how small we are and how meaningless, perhaps, everything we care about is in the universe. And this relationship that she has with John's character um, is very much about that, where he's kind of positing this, like, nothing really matters, let's just do whatever the hell we want, which is so tempting to go into. And she's kind of fighting for meaning. She's kind of fighting for, it does matter. I do care. I am feeling something big. And even though all signs point to nothing matters, I want something to matter very badly. <laughs> and it's kind of the most human thing that we can all relate to, um, even if none of us can actually uh, claim to have been in space. <laughs> John, if I have a favorite scene in the movie, it's you and Natalie in the back of that pickup truck. I wanted like a two hour movie of just that date. <laughs> well, it's coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Lucy in the Truck. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all right, but it's, it's looking good. It's, we've shot some of it. Um, so, was that more than one day of filming? No, it was a day. Uh, and it was a, a well, it was kind of two days. I mean, we had a bit, a bit of it that was sort of yeah. uh, not used, but uh, there was some of it that was uh, a whole other different part of it that you'll see on the DVD. Are those things anymore? <laughs> um, uh, you no, know, it, it was delightful. It was, it's, a, it's a very kind of important part of, of the relationship between these two characters, which is just them sus sussing each other out and kind of figuring out what each of them wants and means to one another and then and then it's the tipping point in the in the relationship where it goes from theoretical to real and uh and it gets real 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 fast as 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 uh as it is want to do sometimes what was uh, what working opposite natalie like to me <laughs> uh, in relation to what you were expecting awful. i mean i'm sorry i don't like her <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, um, Natalie I, I, and I have known one another for, for some time. Um, I think we, I think the first time we met was at SNL. I think right after after wow. like a SNL or something. Wow. Um, and uh, John's a regular. <laughs> Not Very that you lucky. Aren't. <laughs> no, he's he's like invited on all the time. It's the coolest thing ever. Whatever. So are you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we had known one another and it sort of like almost worked together on a couple things here and there and then to get the opportunity to do so was a real pleasure and, and yeah. Mutual. Okay. Thanks, mm -hmm. mutual. Okay. <laughs> Pearl, well, what did you find yourself learning from someone like Natalie, particularly because she's been doing this since she was a teenager <laughs> and, and here you are as a strong young actress? I feel like I learned a lot just in a sense of like how she presented herself on set and just was super professional and really in it. I mean, it was like my first time really, I mean, I did a couple of the episodes of Legion, but it was my first time on set for a prolonged period of time. And so being able to just, I mean, she was my scene partner for most of it. So just being able to react and, and just learn, I guess, from just observing, if that makes sense. And was it comforting to have Noah there since you guys had worked together before? Well, actually, we had oh, never you? met before. Oh, you're kidding. I had seen Noah one day on the episode, but I was too scared to go up because it's like Noah. And I was like, I'm very intimidated. I was like, <laughs> and then I was like, no, and I'm glad I didn't. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten this. But so we had never worked together before, before we met at the callback. Um, but I mean, I love working with Noah, so it was great. Natalie, given the fact that movies rarely, if ever, shoot in chronological order, and this is a story of a woman who really goes through this perfectly calibrated descent, how did you and Noah work to make sure that you were always, you know, pitching it at the right level for when it was edited together? Yeah, it was, that was definitely tricky, um, because it is so specific, and, um, and Noah really built it in a way where the pressure just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting until this kind of like tightly wound spring just explodes. Um, and um, yes, it was, you know, when when the grandmother 
is sick when she passes, when she splits with her husband, when she finds out about the cheating, when she has the problems at work. It's like, it's really just small little increments that just, um, yeah, it was a conversation throughout. Well, and it was interesting because the character on paper is, is theoretical, and then once Natalie and I started working together, there were moments that clearly needed to be changed. There's a moment in the pickup truck where they kiss for the first time, and in the script, the character says, sorry, I don't know why I did that, but that was not, once I got to know Lucy, it's like, oh, she wouldn't apologize for anything. <laughs> that's, that, that's, she, she, so, you know, she sees the moment. Um, so that, that was fascinating to really, to really see the character come alive and, and to adjust the script accordingly. John, was it exciting for you to read the script the first time and be like, I finally get to show off my perfect bowling form? Because <laughs> it's pretty great. Uh, yeah, especially since uh, I was up for Kingpin and I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, it, there, there, was, there was so much that attracted me to this this project, just starting obviously with the script, which was, which was so good and so interesting in a way that um, it's not just this story of a woman on the verge or this kind of love triangle or what have you. It's, it's not as basic as that. It's, it's way, it was way deeper and more intellectual to me. And, and then when, uh, when I first had heard about it, Reese was attached to it and Reese uh, had to fall out because of uh, Big Little Lies 2, Bigger Littler Lies. <laughs> um, and then when when Natalie became attached to that, I was I was like, oh, that's even better, great, awesome. And then Noah and I was like, oh my gosh, all of these things are coalescing and into this project that I feel like is is becoming sort of greater than the sum of its parts. And 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 at every kind of where I looked, there was somebody whose work I really respected and, and enjoyed. And I thought, well, this is an opportunity to really do something interesting and fun. And and there's just not that many opportunities to do those things in Hollywood at the studio level really anymore. It seems like it's become a, you know, a, 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 listen, those movies are awesome and fun too, but the, they're not necessarily for adults or they're not necessarily for people that want to like sit and think and talk about a film afterwards. It's more of just a quick consumption, fast food kind of situation rather than sit with it. And, and I thought, well, this is an opportunity to do the thing that I like to do, which is sort of sit and, and, and indulge in, in it for a while. And, and I was very pleased to be, to be asked and offered. And ball is right. And I did a crush ball. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's pretty rad. <laughs> a couple last things before I open it up to you all. Brian, I'm very intrigued by the moment where we see John's character kind of watching and rewinding the Challenger uh, explosion. Do you, did you guys get a sense that that is something that people who work at NASA are you know, fixate over and, and watch over and over again? I mean, in sitting in the booth at Del Taco and talking about this, one of the things that Elliot and I kept talking about is like, so we're almost killing ourselves just by eating Del Taco every day while we're working. <laughs> but astronauts are like really doing, like it's such a dangerous thing. They're strapping themselves to a bomb and going into space. And like in, for us, like talking about what we would be thinking in these situations, like how could it not be ever present in your mind that what you're doing, you, like what you're doing is such a risk, but, but it's absolutely worth it for them. And so we, we, we talked about that a lot and, and how going to space could have different impacts on different people. You could see sort of earth and, and be able to like cover it up with your thumb and feel how insignificant life is. Or you could also feel like I've done this. Like I got, I got in a spaceship and went to space and saw everything. Like I'm untouchable now. And, and just thinking about all those different sort of ways that people could react to it and what, what the impact on their lives would be. And then Noah, how did you come up with where the Lucy in the Sky cover would show up in the movie? And did you have a hand in, you know, kind of helping to 
pick the artist and all of that. Yes, I I worked with Lisa Hannigan before. She'd done some work for me on Fargo and, and on Legion. Um, she just has this otherworldly voice and, and interpretation of of a song. Um, and then, you know, I felt like that song always existed in that in that place. And you know, to to marry it to this kind of magical infinite zoom of her moving through space and time, which is just meant to evoke, you know, who among us hasn't had a crisis where we can't remember how we got to the hospital? You know, we were so caught up in, is she gonna be okay? What's gonna happen? How am I gonna fix this? That the drive to the hospital, it just never prints in your memory. And so that was my goal with the, the whole film is to create an evocative sense of what it's like to be her that is not necessarily literal, um, but really makes you feel the feeling that she has. You all want to know. Um, well, one thing I really appreciated about this film is that um, I feel like a lot of times <clears throat> when it's a female astronaut, they give her a child back on Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's the drama, like the only drama that a woman could possibly mm -hmm have would be thinking about her child while she's away. Um, so to have a woman who her main emotional drama is having an existential crisis, I thought was kind of radical um, and, and was very meaningful to me. Not to criticize, I love those movies, I'm not trying to be critical, I just thought it was a very, a very unusual... Don't you say she hates it. <laughs> I felt like I was going through my own existential crisis <laughs> with doing this because it is such a crazy thing and I mean working with Noah I definitely felt like he was a very zen person to me on set and I think that really helped like settle my own nerves about it and everyone on set I mean even the crew like I had worked with previously on a Legion episode and so I felt really at home with everyone on set and I think that is what really helped me and I think like the learning curve I mean my biggest scene where I do the um, Mary Oliver poem was my first day. So it was like, I was just kind of jumping right into it and that definitely felt like the lear learning curve was like the first day. Um, but yeah, it was a really fun experience. That wasn't very nice of you to do it that. Was. You had to <laughs> something on the first day. Right? No, it was fine. We, like, we looked out the school window and we pondered life and then I went and did it. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a really great great point and um, it's absolutely a piece of it but I think what's so accurate about Noah's guiding me through it is that it's not one thing um, and that I think is true for most human behavior like it's not a simple oh there's a childhood trauma let's draw a line to you know this behavior as an adult it's like there's many things there's how her family was when she grew up it's sleep deprivation it's the return from space and seeing things differently. It's, um, you know, this issue at work with feeling gender-based discrimination um, and unfairness. It's a man who's treating her badly. It's uh, her grandmother who's been her support dying. It's, it's, there's so many, like every person is a unique constellation of issues to put it in space terms. Um, but we are each like a, a one, we are each unique point of, of, of specificities and, um, and our behavior is a result of all of those complicated things. It's not one input. So yes, that was absolutely an element, but it was not the, the central, there is no central element there. Is, it's just a collection. Well, a lot of it was designed before we were shooting, but then <clears throat> there were definitely moments in the editing room. You know, there's a specific moment in the, in the center of the film where she realizes that, that John may actually be involved with another woman also, in which our central box closed down even farther. And all of it was designed to simulate her, her feelings and the pressure that she was under. Now, I'm also a playful filmmaker, so I can't say there aren't playful elements in it as well. There's certainly one where the box shifts and shifts again, and, and 
Um, so, you know, I, I never tried to use it as an earnest tool, but it is designed um, to be a tool and, and not a gimmick. And obviously, in a perfect world, you may notice the first time or the second time, but then you stop noticing. You know, if you resist it as a technique and you're outside of it, it may interrupt your enjoyment of the film, but if you can go with it and immerse yourself, I think it heightens the experience. Just um, Camera-wise? Yeah. You'd have to ask my... Uh, <laughs> I've already moved on to Fargo, so... <laughs> yeah. You know, we discussed all, all, the, all the possibilities for it, and we tested um, and designed for it. Um, so yes, we, we, we discussed all of it. Eventually, it, it just it was what felt right. Yeah. Um, there were so many um, things. What, what I loved about the film is, is that there's one scene that's a sunrise and another scene that's a sunset, and there's something really magical about shooting under those constraints, which is you can't rewind the sun. So you know, we, we shot elements of, of the sunrise scene um, one evening at, at, at sunset, and then we put Natalie and Dan on the roof. We shot. We had shot all night, and then everyone went went up on the roof, and we shot. We shot the scene um, to connect it to the sunrise, and, you know, and to work really safely. Yeah. 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 Everyone on, on the roof. roof. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know those moments that that actually feel like you're connected to the earth as you're talking about. You know that I think that that really felt special to me, Natalie. Um, the bees were really, that was really one of the most magical experiences of my life. Like afterwards, I was just like, thank you, Noah. Thank, thank you, thank you so much for this experience because that was so, yeah. so cool to just be in the middle of it and holding them and so close to cool. it. Was, yeah, it was I did tell Natalie that I wasn't going to cut until she smiled. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, that was really amazing. And um, Dan also brought um, his telescope every time he shot at night shoots. Mm -hmm. And so, like between takes, we could go look at, you know, sometimes the space station, the space, the International Space Station would like pass right over, and we could we could see it. So it's just like mm -hmm. very those are like yeah. magical moments. John, I had a, a, a fun time. Uh, it's 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 a, just a brief uh, cut. A shot of the film, but there's a, a scene where Natalie and I are talking on the roof of what was meant to be a, a, a space building, a, a building in, in Houston, but it was, we shot it in downtown LA, and LA is kind of an amazing place when you get a little bit elevated, because there aren't that many tall buildings, so you can really see kind of forever, and it was around, like, I believe, sunset, and it was like, mm -hmm. the light was amazing, and it was gorgeous, and we were just sort of sitting on this weird parking garage roof or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we could see, like, all the way, like, forever. And it was like, you get those kind of things every now and again and when you shoot, where you're like, oh, this is a nice, isn't this nice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it just feels good. You don't get that green screen with a tennis ball. That's <laughs> fine. How about you, Pearl? Oh, um, I think one of my most memorable moments was uh, in the car with Ellen and Natalie in the front, and I was like sitting in the back, and they were like, "Do you want to put like a like a stand in or someone?" I was like, "Hell no!" <laughs> um, and like Natalie checked in on me, and she was like, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "Yeah, I like moved my arm in this shot, you know, switching it up." <laughs> and Ellen goes, "Don't move your arm in my shot." <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I'm, like totally fangirling about it. So that was and we were like quizzing her on Mark right. Scorsese. Oh my god, yeah. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, I know. Like, and all these things. How did you get him to do ads? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Ellie, how about finding out that an Emmy winner and two Oscar winners are going to star in your movie? Well, you know, it is. it has been a series of surprises and surprises for us, uh, you know, since the beginning. I was just talking with Brian about um, the moment we had first... Um, we had met with Reese uh, after we had written this spec in the Del Taco. We had passed along to our agents, and, and they had said, oh, this would be a great thing for Reese. And we had said, ha, 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 that's a great joke. Um, but, you know, it had gotten to her, and she was a really quick read, and we had gotten the call back saying, she would like to meet with you tonight at the Polo Lounge. And, uh, you know, we had, like, lost the capacity to laugh. Um, Brian was uh, going to head off to a ski trip with his in-laws, but we said, sure, whatever, we'll figure out a way to do it. We'll try our best to not look nervous. We'll run a comb through our hair. Um, and so I raced over there. 
uh, I guess it's at the, the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I remember um, walking through the entrance, there was a guy at the door saying, welcome back, sir, and I was so nervous, I wanted to say, you know I've never been here. <laughs> um, and so we go to the polo lounge, and the name was her name, and Brian had said, so here, uh, the name is Reese Witherspoon, uh, and we expected to be laughed out, and Brian said she's over there, and pointed to her, and she had gotten there early and finished her salad, and we thought, oh no, what can we do? So we sat down, I ordered the first thing that was on the menu that I saw, which was a Moscow mule, which is not food, <laughs> and we did the best that we could and talked about, I think a lot of things that we've heard here, what it is that really excites us about this story. And, um, you know, later that night, she reached out to her people and said she was in, and it really changed our lives, and it has just continued. Um, you know, with Coral and John and Natalie and Noah um, really taking the ball and running with it, um, we're still trying to process it, um, but it's been amazing. Um, I think that every movie that it's about a woman as a, as a complex human being with her own um, very specific intentions, flaws, strengths, just showing kind of a complete humanity is feminist. So yes, I think like the more different kinds of representations of women, the more complicated, the more they are agents of their own narrative. Um, that's part of allowing women to be all different kinds of things. Not allowing, but showing women how they are, which is a vast, infinite array of possibility. Yeah, for me, this isn't, uh, it's not a fad. It's a continuation of the work that I've been doing since I started in, in my career and trying to tell stories about strong, complicated women, often with flaws. Um, and you know, I think I think you would see more of those films, and hopefully you will see more of those films, um, because those stories are are ever more important to tell. <laughs> Natalie, I know you're not really an you're not really an astronaut. You're just finally in the movie. No, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to convince NASA to <laughs> go with them. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would totally be an astronaut. Be an astronaut for a day or a month or a year. It sounds like the coolest thing in the world. Uh, and it is, having spoken to several astronauts and met them, and my thing is all the math. <laughs> and the skill set, which not, is not little, enough math. You're just saying. not enough math. <laughs> I like more math. Um, I would. I would relish the opportunity to go into space and see that. I mean, I think that's part of part of the central thrust of the narrative arc of the film is how intoxicating that is and how unique it is. How few people get to see it, and uh, I would I would take that opportunity in a heartbeat. I didn't mean to hijack your question, but I totally I, did. I, it was for both of you. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to visit NASA and talk to some astronauts there during my tour who had been on the space station and they were describing how physically it was so hard to come back that they could, they called it, that they were like um, like burning the rubber on their on their sneakers because it's like hard to pick up your feet after being in no gravity. They were just like sludging your feet. And um, and then of course the, the there is a, a whole protocol for like psychological well-being because it is really shocking to be there and back for everybody and that there's also like a, quite a lot of vetting that they do of potential astronauts for their social emotional well-being because even being up there is really hard to be with this small group of people in a confined space for extended periods of time in very sometimes stressful conditions um, uh, that you have to be pretty um, stable to even get the opportunity to go, which makes it even more remarkable that someone could have such an extreme um, unraveling upon their return.
Well, unlike the ballet world, the astronaut um, space world is uh, more of a situation where women are one at a time players, <clears throat> which is like in a lot of positions of power, women get a slot, you know, a seat at the table. Um, and when you're one of a kind, you can be otherized, you can be the woman. Oh, you know the one, the woman in the room, right? But if there's more than one, you have to pay attention to someone's personality. You have to say, oh, you know the one who is more into this specific kind of, you know, planetary, uh, you know, disposition or whatever, that you have to actually pay attention to some characteristics about the person, their humanity, to describe them if you're talking about them. You can't just be like, oh, the girl. And um, I think there's a very specific thing about being the one um, in the workplace that is a very different situation than being in, you know. There's also the other thing that's interesting about women's work is that it tends to usually either be one or like a women's field, like ballet, nursing, teaching, like, it, it, that's why the equal pay conversation is super complicated because there's whole occupations that are only women, so, or majority women, so, and those tend to be lower paid occupations, so it's not like equal pay, you know, anyway, it's a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on. Excellent, just <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Beautifully expressed. I have to keep you guys on a schedule, so that's all the time, but I want to thank Noah.